Welcome back guys. In this video we will be talking about the introductory part of Haemophila species type of bacteria. And the first important thing I want you to know is that Haemophila species type of bacteria, they are also of gram negative uh, type of bacteria. Uh, but they are not uh, the typical type of uh, gastrointestinal kind of bacteria because they are not enteric type of bacteria. They are non enteric gram negative type of bacteria. Uh, and uh, in this case of the Haemophila uh, species, uh, they are they are pleomorphic in shape. So let me write. They are pleomorphic, pleomorphic in shape. Right. So this is a first important thing you should notice about uh, from the rest of the gram-negative uh, rods uh, that most of the cases gram-negatives are rod, right, or bacillus shape. shape. But in case of this Haemophila species, they are pleomorphic in shape. That means they are ranging from different structures. Structures like coccobacilli. So let me write coccobacilli. So this is a typical kind of structure. Coccobacilli structure to, to long. Sorry. To a kind of long structure. Long slender like a filamentous structure. So let me write filamentous. Okay. So, these are the structural variations. That's why they are called as pleomorphic in nature. That means they are not having any kind of defined structure. They can ranging from coccobacillus. So, let me draw. Coccobacillus means it will something like coccus means spherical or round like that. Bacillus means like this rod shaped. Coccobacillus means a kind of mixture of both this coccus and bacillus all together. And we are having this the coccobacillus type. Now, in this case, we can have this coccobacillus structure or else we can also have this spiral kind of structure, right? Like helicobacter pylori and all these things. So, it's a spiral. So, it's again spiral structure. So, any kind of like the spiral or filamentous. Filamentous means, let's say, let's say if this is the bacteria, they are attached with each other, make a filament like structure when they are arranged with each other like that. Okay, So, this is a kind of structure. If you are uh, looking it under a microscope, you can find that all the bacteria are linked with each other. They are uh, attached with each other, making a filament, right? So, they are having structural variations. That's why they, we call them as, them as pleomorphic. Now, uh, they are obligate kind of parasite. That is another very important point is that they are obligate, obligate parasite. Parasite, uh, we know all that parasite, what parasites do. Now, they harm host cell for the benefits for themselves, right? So, these are parasites, host, these are obligate kind of parasites. They require this parasitism for their life and for their living, okay? And for this purpose, what they require, they require, so why we are calling them as parasites? Because we have already seen many pathogenic bacteria before. We haven't termed any of them as obligate parasites or as parasites in that sense. But in this case, we are calling it as parasites because what they are doing here, they require some important factors from host. Except for those factors, they can't grow. So, the factors they require is two important things. One is a hemin. One is hemin or hemin, whatever. This is a protein with heme group. So, it's a protein with iron group. So, that's a very important part, hemin. That's why it's called a hemin. And the second thing they require in this case, the second thing they require is NAD+. So, they require these two sources, NAD+, and hemin, for their proper growth. That's why they require the, any kind of host cell for their living, which can supply them hemin and NAD+. Okay, so that's why in most of the cases, as they require a protein with heme, we know in our body we are having a protein with heme in it, with iron in the center part of it, and the protein name is red blood cell, right, or hemoglobin, right, the protein is hemoglobin, you know that, and hemoglobin is present in red blood cell, right, so that's why we look at the name, it is suggested hemophilus, right, because phyl means, which uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, that means we have already talked about, let's say, uh, electrophile, or we have talked about uh, thermophile. That means they love that particular thing to do. Now here these are hemophile. That means they are in love with him, right? So they are. They require him. They need him. That's why they want him for their growth. 
so they can get the heme from hemoglobin so can he lies hemoglobin in this case that's why they are called hemophilus species and there are several different members of the hemophilus species but in this particular video and this video series we'll be talking about hemophilus influenza or hemophilus hemophilus influenza so let me write hemophilus hemophilus influenza sorry should write it pretty clearly influenza influenza a e so this is hemophilus influenza we will be talking about this hemophilus influenza in throughout this video course okay and we have seen that they are they require special media so if we want to grow them in lab we must grow them in chocolate agar media so in chocolate agar media so we can grow in lab using uh, chocolate agar chocolate agar media and obviously the media must contain the media here must contain nad plus and heme so this thing you should keep in your mind that they require heme and nad plus for their growth all the time now why we are at all bothering about this hemophilia species because this hemophilia species is a very very dangerous kind of species which can cause several kinds of diseases and the disease we are going to talk about are really dangerous in some uh, point of your life because they can cause a simple milder fever and they can cause uh, sinusitis they can cause epiglottitis and all this kind of infections but the most important and dangerous part about that they can also cause meningitis right so let me write this particular thing here meningitis right and not only meningitis but a severe form of meningitis can be caused by this hemophilus species so that's make this hemophilus species a very very clinical significant bacteria for the study of for the study right so now in the future video we'll be seeing about the infections thank you uh, one thing i forgot to mention there is that hemophilus influenzae are obviously the normal component of our upper respiratory tract so this is very important i must talk about it before so they are a common microflora so they are a normal microflora of upper respiratory tract okay and they can be transferred via the via respiratory tract infections and obviously they can transfer via air uh, as a micro droplet from one person to another person and another very very important concept is that this type of bacteria they are having only one host as human right so the host for this bacteria the only host is human being so they cannot they cannot infect other other organisms other like other uh, our pet and cattle and all these things they can only infect us that's why the only reason for spreading this influenza is via the human to human contact okay and they are having several different kinds of strains of influenza among all this type of influenza virus or not virus we are talking about bacteria sorry now all the type of hemophilus influenza or hemophilus other kind of species especially hemophilus influenza now those illness all those bacteria they can have a kind of capsule outside so they can have so let me write they can have capsule outside the cell membrane so if i draw the structure if i draw it will something it will look something like that under electron microscope if i am drawing two or three bacteria along with each other like that and if i draw now uh, sorry let me change it if i draw let's say the capsule the capsule will something look like this the capsule will be covering the bacteria like that so this is the capsular region this capsule always present there now depending upon this capsulation we can have different strains of influenza uh, or different strains of hemophilus actually not influenza because this capsule can be of different types they are having different kind of proteins or subunit of proteins that are arranged to make this kind of capsules and the subunit of proteins that we get is, is it can be subunit a or b and all these things now if you are talking about that particular influenza or hemophilus influenza having this b type of subunit to make its capsule we usually call them h i 
B or Haemophilus influenza B type. Now, whenever we are talking about uh, that particular influenza, influenza having the A type of subunit to make their capsule, we call them HIA uh, or Haemophilus influenza A type, right? So, depending upon this thing, it will vary from one thing to another thing. Now, these capsules are providing them some extra layer to protect themselves against phagocytosis and any other kind of host cell defenses. That's a very important advantage they get uh, by this encapsulation. Or there are sometimes other kind of bacteria which lack this kind of encapsulations. Okay, but uh, these are pretty common and the spread of this influenza is via sporadic in occurrence. As you can see here, the spread is via uh, nasal region, via those uh, respiratory droplet from one person to another person. But they can also colonize in conjunctiva and also genital tract. So let me write this part. They can also so also colonize so they can colonize in conjunctiva conjunctiva and also in genital tract so these are the important properties about uh, hemophilus influenza in little bit and i hope that's helpful thank you Welcome guys, so we have already talked about the introductory part about uh, Haemophilus species and especially about the Haemophilus influenzae and in this video we will be talking about a little bit about infection or mode of infecting, this let me talk about infection, infection caused by Haemophilus species especially Haemophilus influenzae. Now in this case of uh, infection, uh, usually the infections caused by Haemophilus influenzae uh, is related with or it can be divided into two different types. The first kind of disorders are milder, but the second type are dangerous, uh, like meningitis, which is a which is a world uh, known and which is one of the leading cause for bacterial meningitis. Uh, is is this Haemophilus influenzae, right? Now let's let's talk about it. So let's the, let's talk about the first kind. The first kind I have talked about that these are the mild symptoms. Now the symptoms we are talking about here sinu, sinusitis. So let me write sinusitis. Sinusitis is a kind of infection, uh, and obviously uh, we are having bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia. Here bronco means it is related with bronchus, right? So bronchopneumonia. Pneumonia. Okay, and we are also having epiglottitis, epiglottitis, and so on, etc. So we are having diseases like that: sinusitis, epiglottitis, bronchopneumonia, and all these things. And all of these diseases, these things are are related with the respiratory tract, right? Respiratory tract. So all of them. Uh, respiratory is not S, yes, it shouldn't be any S, yes, respiratory tract infections. Now, all these respiratory tract infections are there because this particular microflora, which is the Haemophilus influenzae, it presents in our upper respiratory tract. And then it, it usually lives in, it lives in, sorry, it lives, lives in upper respiratory tract mucosa. Usually present there in upper respiratory tract mucosa. Now in it, it colonized there and it colonized there. So let me know. It colonized there. So let me if if I if I draw the diagram for you. So let's say let's say this is the respiratory tract. So let's talk about it. This is the respiratory tract here, and here it gets the division, and from here it's getting another division. And from this division again, they are further divided into smaller segment like that, and we go on like that, and finally it will branch and branch. Finally, it will reach. It will reach like that. So, okay. And if I draw two of our, so, so let me come down a little bit. Okay. So here, let me draw. If these are our lungs, two of our lungs, one is large, one is small, anyways, slightly larger. So here it is, 
uh, if you draw this is the respiratory system of ours and in this case we are going to find this bacteria we are going to find this bacteria colonize in this upper respiratory tract so if i zoom in to this upper respiratory tract here what we can find is something like that so let me draw this what we'll find we'll find this so cross section of it right so we make a cross section and then looking at it so you'll get here these are the cell lining of the cells in upper respiratory tract and this upper respiratory tract is very very mucus because all the time the mucus is surrounding this part it is required because the mucus or all these malts and galls or those mucosa associated tissues so mucosa mucosa associated associated tissues these tissues are very very helpful to protect us against a kind of infection right so that's why this is a infection barrier that is present always there right in this case this bacteria this kind of bacteria they come and they usually colonize here so let's say these red things are the bacteria and they start they, they start to colonize here in this mucosa in this upper respiratory tract mucosa right so this colonization is usually in this mucosa layer but now they start to degrade this mucosa la layer using certain kind of enzymes and after the degradation of this mucosa layer it can evade inside the tissue of bronchus it can invade inside now then it will reach then it will reach so let me draw this in this part also let's say here these are the bacteria they come out in the tissue and they sooner reach the blood stream so they reach the blood stream now as they are reaching the blood stream then the spread will be very very fast very very fast very fast spread and in those cases they will spread from one place to another place right so that's why in the, in the very beginning they usually colonize their upper respiratory tract mucosa then they will be spread it from one place to another place now in this during the spread if they are spread in our sinus we can call it sinusitis and they colonize there cause the disease inflammation we call it sinusitis if they spread towards epiglottis which is somewhere upper in this place so epiglottis then in those case uh, if they colonize there causes inflammation and damage of the tissue there we call it epiglottitis and then if they colonize down reach some some somewhere a little bit down like this bronchus region so these are the bronchus region so these are the sections of bronchus right so let me uh, draw this for you so it, here it is we are having the epiglottis here we are having the bronchus so depending upon depending upon depending upon where they are colonizing and causing the infection we name them we name the disease differently right so if they are colonizing there we call it bronchopneumonia so there there are the different diseases caused by this mechanism right now all, all this these are the first or basic type of infection that we are going to we have talked about now the second and more severe kind of infections are always there and this type of infections are remember I have already talked about it, meningitis, meningitis, which is a life-threatening disease. And uh, there are different causes of meningitis, different causative organisms of meningitis. One of them uh, is Neisseria meningitis also. But uh, most of these meningitis diseases, and one of the uh, one of the uh, greatest or leading cause of bacterial meningitis is Haemophilus influenzae. Okay, and usually the, this kind of meningitis caused by Haemophilus influenzae, they attack infants infants more they attack more infants but not not uh, developed or adult organisms not developed uh, human being they are uh, in fact uh, in fact infants okay and in very young children and in this case they are frequently uh, it is related with other kind of diseases like conjunctival infection and genital infections in all these cases now in meningitis this is a severe form right now uh, this is also uh, this is related and this this meningitis is usually of a small or milder type in most of the cases but if it is uh, lead to, uh, to untreated condition or chronic condition it can be transferred into fulminant meningitis and this fulminant or fulminant meningitis is the 
one of the most severe form of meningitis and usually what do you mean by meningitis meningitis means there is a kind of infection spread onto the brain in some region of the brain and as a result of the spread of this bacteria onto this brain region they start to degrade some of the tissues there and eventually it will lead to it will lead to uh, brain what we can say freezing we can call brain freezing or it's a kind of any kind of brain damage brain freezing and usually people can turn in, into coma also right so all this thing, all these things can uh, result and it, it results in infants because infants can have a high range of contamination from uh, from their mother in these cases because if the infection is present in the genital region of the mother it will be transferred into infants okay so so these are the major kind of infections and in the future video will be talking about more now another imp imp infection is there i forgot to mention another infection is there and that infection is called as septic septic arthritis arthritis and the septic arthritis is a kind of sepsis and bacterial uh, sepsis usually sets place and usually they start to necrosis uh, necrosis of the tissue in our bone actually so bone so it is necrosis of bone cartilage and bone can be there Okay, so you can see this disease is started from a particular place, a particular region, which is a mucosa-associated uh, tissue or mucosa layer, upper GI tract. But then it can evade through the bloodstream, and whenever it reaches the bloodstream, it starts to infect other people. It starts to infect uh, and and be transferred from one place to another place, and it will start causing infections like uh, uh, sinusitis, bronchitis, and epiglottitis. And but all of them, all of these things are related to GI, uh, sorry, uh, RI tract infections, right? respiratory tract infections most of them all of them in fact they are related with but the second and severe form of the disease is meningitis it is uh, occurred in several different species it is occurring in the brain and the brain tissues and also septic arthritis can be there which is a disease in the separate tissue in our uh, arm or leg uh, especially in the bones okay so that's it and i hope that's helpful thank you so in this video we'll be talking about the hemophilus influenzae pathogenesis now i have already talked about uh, this uh, some point of the pathogenesis in previous video which is the infectivity or infection but still in this video i'm going to talk about the beginning so let's talk about pathogenesis pathogenesis so pathogenesis means we all know that uh, there are certain tactics that bacteria uses to start and cause an infectivity in an host organism, right? Now, they are having a mode of spread and the mode of spread uh, for the hemophilus influenzae uh, is a respiratory droplet, right? So, the mode of spread is respiratory, respiratory droplet and the respiratory droplet usually means sneezing. During sneezing, we are having a lot of respiratory droplet coming out from one or, uh, individual to another individual and they, this can cause disease. Now, uh, except for this transmission, there are other types of transmission inside a single host, which is a tissue to tissue transmission via, uh, via bloodstream, right? Now, if I draw our structure again, I have already drawn, uh, I have already made this clear in the previous video, but still let us draw. So, let's say here, this is the, uh, our cross section view of upper respiratory tract. So let me write, this is a cross section view of upper respiratory tract, okay. And in this case what we can get, here we get our mucosa layer, our upper respiratory tract mucosa, right. So let me again point this out, this is mucosa mucosa layer and this region is the cells right so this is the cells upper respiratory tract cells are present there a tissue is present also there right now in this case this bacteria usually colonize there in this mucosa usually they colonize in the mucosa they start to adhere to the mucosa and start infecting the cell and as they start infecting this they start to destroy the mucosa and reach this cell and finally they can reach to the bloodstream right so from this cell they can reach the bloodstream now as they are reaching to the bloodstream they the infection can be spread from one place to another place right now mostly mostly this infection is called uh, it is spread in the upper upper 
respiratory tract right respiratory tract regions uh, of upper respiratory tract like regions of upper respiratory tract like epiglottis sinus and also remember epiglottis sinus are also bronchus right so they can infect these particular regions and colonize there uh, via the bloodstream right by the spread by bloodstream okay uh, but uh, the, the pathogenesis that they usually carry is they are simple because they are gram negative organisms. They are uh, they are a kind of uh, they can be of rod shape, they can be of coccobacillus like structure, they can be of uh, spiral structure. Actually, they are amorphic. That's why we call it amorphous kind of structure. But in this case, uh, this is a way of spreading. The way of spreading is that they can secrete certain kind of enzymes. Let me know certain kinds of enzymes are secreted, and those enzymes will destroy destroy respiratory tract mucosa they will destroy they will destroy respiratory tract mucosa pretty easily pretty fast okay so this is the first thing they will destroy the respiratory tract mucosa and after the destruction this cell will enter inside now during this enter of the cell inside uh, inside enter of the bacteria inside the Host cell, it requires the receptor mediated endocytosis or simple form of endocytosis. Okay, so that means in this case the bacteria will adhere here after the bacteria adherence here. So let me draw this particular section here. So bacteria adheres there and then the endocytosis that means uh, we are having vesicles inside the vesicles. What we are having inside the vesicles will be having our bacteria engulfed, then this bacteria will fuse and then they will be chopped out and all these things will work but most of the case the bacteria secret some enzymes which will destroy the cellular mode of degradation and then they will still living and then they will spread via bloodstream from this region into other regions okay <coughs> sorry that's the basic part of uh, the process of infect infectivity and the second important part is that in any kind of pathogenesis, we have already seen that in any kind of pathogenesis, the bacteria must evade the host immunity or the host immune system, right? Now, we know that this kind of bacteria, this hemophilus influenza bacteria, they are having a capsular coat outside, right? So, they are having capsules. So this is the first things, enzymes, which are important. Second things are capsules. We have already seen that. They are having capsules. So, this capsule will help them will help them to to go against phagocytosis right phagocytosis means there are cells like cells like macrophage cells like neutrophil dendritic cells right all these cells are there we should try to engulf this particular kind of bacteria but in this case, they are having capsules. This capsule will prevent uh, this macrophage and dendritic cells to engulf uh, hemophilus influenzae. So, this is another very important activity. And another third kind of activity is also there to go against and evade the host immune system, and that is to destroy the antibodies produced against this typical type of bacteria. So, third thing, third thing, antibodies produced. So so antibody degrading enzymes definitely antibody degrading enzyme right because there are certain antibodies provided by the host cell to function against this particular bacteria so let's say here this is the bacteria so let me uh, simulate the event this is the bacteria and antibody go and bind there and what antibody can do they can bind and they can activate complement right so complement activation will be there and what we know that if complement is activated it will make pour onto the cell and it will eventually kill the bacterial cell right or else this bacteria coated with this anti antibodies are better food for this uh, engulfing cells like macrophage and dendritic cells and all these things right so in both the ways the bacteria is going to die if they are tagged with anti uh, antibodies like that Right? And usually the antibody that host cell produces to go against hemophilus influenzae is antibody or immunoglobulin A. 
okay and we know that immunoglobulin a is present via the secretion system so in any kind of naso nasal secretion and any kind any kind of secretion uh, uh, like our tears it contains immunoglobulin a because immunoglobulin a are presented in uh, Dimer like structure, two immunoglobulin A molecules are hold together via J chain and all these things. We have studied it in our immunology regions, if you, if you remember. Now, this immunoglobulin A can come and bind there and it can coat the bacteria so that the bacteria can be degraded via complement or via the uh, degradation or, or in, engulfment via macrophage or dendritic cells, which is called the opsonization, right? But in this case, what they are producing some enzymes which will degrade this immunoglobulin A. And the enzyme is uh, called as IgA protease. So it produces IgA protease. Now this IgA protease enzyme, as the term suggests, protease, that means they are protein degrading enzyme. And immunoglobulins are also proteins. So this IgA protease will degrade, so will degrade IgA. As a result, they cannot coat the bacterial cell. So bacterial cell can leave for longer period of time. So this is another way of going against our immune system. And usually they can cause infections by spreading from one place to another place like that. Now in, in most of the cases the infections are milder. The small infections like, like epiglottitis, sinusitis and bron bronchopneumonia and all these things. But the most severe forms are meningitis. In those cases it is we don't have anything more to do. So that's when we need to be very careful about uh, looking at whether the infection is setting place because it can spread from one place to another, from another place. The bacteria can easily spread because they are affecting the mucosa, so the mucosa will be vulnerable to not only these bacteria but also other bacteria too, right? So in in this case, we need to be very careful about that. And I hope this video helps you to understand the pathogenesis. Thank you. Okay, guys. So we have already seen. Uh, the important in, important infectious properties of Haemophilus influenza, and also we have seen uh, the treatment. Uh, also, have seen the pathogenesis of that. Now, in this video, we'll be talking about the treatment a little bit about treatment of Haemophilus influenza. Now, for the treatment part, Haemophilus in influenza, as we all know, that they can cause diseases like uh, milder kind of disease like uh, epiglottitis or sinusitis, like that, and obviously. Uh, sometimes they can also cause da dangerous kind of disease like meningitis, right? Now, usually, uh, we are more worried about uh, the disease meningitis. So, for that reason, we need to provide something which will cure this uh, disease meningitis. Okay, and which will kill bacteria like uh, Haemophilus species from growing inside, right? Now, for that reason, usually, this, this, uh, due, due to the infection of Haemophilus influenza, many meningitis patients uh, were dead in early days, early days, like before 1960s, 1980s, 1970s at that particular time. But after developing uh, of a vaccine, this particular meningitis outbreak by Haemophilus species is getting reduced. So, what we develop, we develop here a vaccine. Right, the vaccine we developed in this case is called PRS. I guess it's called poly polyribose phosphate or PRP vaccine. It's called PRP vaccine, or uh, it is named as the full form is polyribose phosphate. Polyribose phosphate polyribose phosphate vaccine okay now what do you mean by this polyribose phosphate vaccine actually if you remember the structure uh, of hemophilus influenza we can see something like that so there are bacteria like uh, amorphic structure like that which is having a coat outside right which is having a capsular coat outside now this capsule that we have already seen we have discussed about this is called the capsular region right so this capsule we have seen, this capsule is made up with, it is made up with polyribose sugar. So this, it is it is actually made up with carbohydrates, you all, all know that. You all know that, made up with carbohydrates, usual carbohydrates. But here, uh, the carbohydrates we are seeing are ribose, not the other kind. These are ribose, right? Ribose are simply pentose type of sugar, which is having 5 carbon ring. A structure kind of like that which is present also in DNA and RNA things so ribose sugar so there are polyribose that means many ribose will uh, be attached together to make this kind of capsular structure right now uh, what we do in case of the vaccination is simply cut 
sum of the section out from here. So we take this capsular segment. So what we take? So let me write. We take uh, this polyribose, polyribose capsule, and what we do? Capsule segment actually. And what we do here? We attach it with a carrier protein. With a carrier protein. Okay. So we attach it with a carrier protein. Now this particular construction with a polyribose capsule with a carrier protein, we call this whole thing as we call this whole thing as our PRP vaccine. Call it a PRP vaccine. Or this is also used or termed as a hemophilus influenza vaccine. Now this vaccine we can use to, to, to kill, uh, not, not actually kill, the use of vaccine is to prevent the disease because this vaccine will help development of our immune system so that in future if this particular bacteria infect us, our immune system is already being prepared for that. Okay, but if the infection is onset, in those cases, what we can do, in those cases we can use antibiotics for the treatment. We can use antibiotics. So let me come. Can use antibiotics. Now, among this antibiotic, sorry, among the antibiotic part, among the antibiotics part, what we can use, we can use uh, among penicillins, we can use ampicillin. So let me write, we can use ampicillin. Okay, and we can also use cefotaxim. Among the cephalosporins, we can use cefotaxim. So let me write, we can use cefo Taxin. Remember, cefotaxim is a third generation cephalosporin, or you can also use ceftriaxone, or you can use ceftriaxone. Triaxone. Okay. Or among the other type of antibiotics, you can use trimethoprim and all these things. Okay. And in those cases, who, who, the personnel handling with the vaccines, handling with these PRP vaccines. In those cases, we usually treat them with rifampin. We usually treat, treat them with rifampin. Okay. So, usually with rifampin. So, these are the different modes of treatment uh, to stop these diseases. Because uh, and all the different type of uh, hemophilus influenza, hemophilus species, as we have as already discussed, that those things, uh, this capsular thing is important because this capsule is antigenic in nature, it's immunogenic, it will develop into, uh, it, it will help developing immune system, so that's why they are called immunogenic in nature. So if we use them as a production, of, for the production of vaccine, it will be called a subunit vaccine because we are utilizing a subunit of a bacterial cell to produce vaccine, right? So this PRP vaccine is a kind of subunit vaccine, right? kind of subunit vaccine okay and another thing is that this capsular part is important because it is giving the mo one of the most important virulent factors to the bacterial cell so depending upon the type of capsule and type of sugars that are present in capsule the different type of bacteria varies right now usually uh, depending upon the different uh, chemical nature of this capsule we can have different like like hemophilus influenza b hemophilus influenza a and so on Right? And among these different different types of hemophilus influenza bacteria, hemophilus influenza B or HIB is the most virulent one. This is the dangerous one because this type of influenza usually causes uh, meningitis. Right? So, so in those cases, we need to take up uh, the capsular part from HIB and then you can prepare uh, this PRP vaccine. Okay. So that's in a sense is uh, the treatment part. And I hope it's helpful. Thank you.